My subject today, as you all know from the announcement, is fundamentals. So what are these fundamentals? The fundamental thing is that we all want to be able to play the harp for people. In fact, I think that probably we could say that our goal in studying the instrument at all is to be able to play for an audience nicely, hopefully from memory, usually. I mean, we can all agree the standard for performance on an instrument, especially in terms of competition, is memorization. Also, in the concert hall, I believe the standard for performance is memorization. It's not a performance, and frankly, if you don't memorize. It is a reading, no better than a reading. It may be good, but it's not a performance. So the big question is, how do we go from being anxious, wished I was a performer, to somebody who goes out with no music and plays a whole concert from memory? Where do these people get that confidence? And I decided. It is the same place that every other great performer gets the confidence. For example, a ballet dancer. Ballet dancers do endless exercises a million times so that when they go on stage, I can do this because I've done it a million times. But you have to have done it a million times. What, have, what do you have to do a million times? The same thing that you do when you go out stage. You make a beautiful sound. Now, um, perhaps you saw the newsletter from Mary Ratzbinner's uh, newsletter from Melody Music. <clears throat> she sent out a newsletter recently. And she has been including little uh, kind of tips and suggestions and things in the newsletter. Did anybody notice that she said something along the lines of, press the string before you play the string? Did anybody? Did you see that? Mm -hmm. You did? Remember you remember that? Did you, anybody ask himself, what in the world is she talking about? Press the string before you play the string. Wait a minute here. What's going on? <laughs> well, you will be interested to know that when I started my studies, a half a century ago, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, my teacher prepared me and instructed me to practice pressing the string, release the string, then play the string. Not in performance, but as an exercise. So obviously pressing the string before you play it in performance is, is not suitable for a performance situation. You're on a time schedule there. But in practice, you can pretty much do anything you want. And this is a very good thing to do. Now, um, Molly, when I talked to her a few days ago, reminded me about something like that having to do with that. And that is, she talked about how she takes tennis lessons. She's a handball player, right? And yeah. tennis. Yeah. And tennis. So you said, I like my tennis lesson because you, you go in there, you try something, you say, how did it go? And then you make a little change, or the teacher will, will say, Just try it this way, and you do it again and see how did it go. And that's fun to do. Mm -hmm. Try something, adjust, and you learn. And this is the same thing with the experience of doing this exercise. Press, release, play, relax, and repeat. <laughs> somebody once asked uh, the golfer, Lee Trevino, you may remember somebody from the past, Lee Trevino, famous golfer. How do you get to be a great golfer, Lee Trevino? He said, easy, hit 300 balls a day, and you'll become a great golfer. <laughs> well, he's not being facetious. It's quite true that if you do something hundreds of times a day, you'll get better at it, especially if you do it with consciousness, intention, focus. Obviously, hitting 300 balls a day and without thinking about it, you're not going to become a better golfer. So the process of doing what I'm going to suggest, everybody try. In fact, I'd like to invite Rachel and uh, John, if you want, and uh, Angela at your harps. Is it going to be okay with people if they play, if everyone gets to try this on the harps, the ones who brought their own instruments? Okay. <clears throat> what I'm going to suggest is actually, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been told uh, in recent years, people describe it. They say you're going to do something like a gymnastics routine. They'll say, run through the routine in your mind every bit. And 
And so you're doing it, you're basically taking it away from the pra actual practice, and you're doing something where you're running through it away from the, from the, the balance beam or whatsoever. This process is basically a microcosm of what happens when you step up on stage, you sit down, you play, and then you leave, and you go. And it consists of, if everybody would just go look at me, fourth finger. I do this all over the instrument. This is my basic practice, but I'm going to do A's to A's, and I'd like you to put it on the low A. Fourth finger by itself. The fingers are in the palm, and you put some pressure on that finger. Okay, put some pressure on that string and try to flatten this out if you can. Try to flatten this joint so that it's strong. I just want to emphasize one thing. We're doing something athletic. There's a mechanics here, a, me a mechanical element, and a physical and athletic element. Uh, has anybody ever seen a golfer who's going to tee off the tee box? Go like this, like that, with their elbows. Bing! No. They take the ball thumb, they put it back as far as they can, and they make as huge of an arc as they can, right? Like this, and they follow through with a huge arc. Same thing here. If you're playing and your fingers are like this, there's not a very big range of motion available. Well, the sound, the quality of the sound, comes from your range of motion, just as the distance on the drive comes from the range of motion that you bring to it. You're never going to see somebody bing, like that. Or they'll never see them hit and then stop, follow through, right? And that's part of the process. So uh, you place, and you're going to put some pressure. Fingers are in the palm. The fourth is out, set away from the rest of them. You put pressure on that joint, because this is where you get the big range of motion, from this one, not from this one. This is not a very good way to get a beautiful set. So, so you put the finger on. You find a perfectly good, the best place you can possibly find the ideal seating for a note. Okay? Take your time. You've got time. Put the pressure on the joint. And make the finger kneel. Make the finger kneel at this joint. At this joint. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, so the only thing is you place it in a good place. And now I want to invite everyone to press the string whilst keeping the hand perfectly stable. In other words, you mustn't use your arm to play the string. You use the strength of the individual finger to play the string. So place it with stability. Press one time. Release. Play. Relax. That's all there is to it. But the key is moving the string without actually playing it. You're just preparing. You're strengthening your finger, and you're preparing, and you're proving yourself. I can play this string without using my whole arm. Because the trouble with using your whole arm is now you're out here. You're not there where you need to be for, guess what, the next one. Funny about that. So what we need to do is build up the individual strength of the individual fingers. So OK, let's start with you. So put some pressure on there. Fingers are in. Put some pressure on there. Yeah, this one can stay loose and relaxed with the four. Three and four and pinky always together. Okay? No teacups. No teacups. No curling away. Four and pinky are always just together, like natural twins. Okay. So pressure. Put some pressure on there. Does that feel strong to you? Fingers are gripping the palm. Okay, hold on. Strong. Strong. Okay, make it kneel. Make it stand away. Okay, dip your wrist. Okay, so find a very good seating for your fourth, and then just using the strength that you can muster, push the string, release the string, play the string. Okay, I want to see a big push. I want it to be pushed all the way up to the next string and back. Yeah, and then play. Just one push, one play. Yeah, yeah. now not using the whole not using the whole hand. One strength and play. And then the critical element is you listen to the sound. And you say, how do I like that sound? Do I like that sound? Would I pay thirty dollars for a ticket to hear somebody play that sound? <laughs> Go ahead and touch. Fingers are in the palm. Fingers are in the palm where they're gonna be because this is where they all end up. Okay? Fourth is out, 
you put some pressure on it and you make that knuckle kneel. Because you're not curling your fingers because that's too that's a weak pressure. Well, my teacher likes me to keep my fingers round. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, that doesn't give you a big range of motion. And since you're going to end up with your fingers flat in the palm and not like this, because frankly, this doesn't really produce a big sound. Little sound, big sound. Okay, okay, there are things. When I said that this is like a little microcosm of the performance, the before, the during, the middle, the after, it is. You place the finger. This is just like saying, I set the date for my concert. Once you set the date for your concert, you're committed. We think, we hope. You place it, you take your time. You get to decide when the concert is. You get to decide when that note's going to get played. Now, I do them in rhythm, but I do them in a set rhythm for a set volume, because that's what we're asked to do things in time. Once you're committed, I think you should stay committed. There's no, I don't feel like it today. Okay? Once you're on, if your name is on the program, you're definitely committed. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> this, is, this is a process just like the performance. You set the date by placing your finger and you choose a good date for yourself and you choose a good place to, play, to place that finger, a secure, the best possible seating for that finger. And I did this on all four fingers, in all registers, up and down, at all volumes. So when I, music says P, it comes out P because I know how to make my fingers. Because frankly, dynamic contrast is a big issue in our instrument. You can go hear a lot of really hot players who play fast and loud, but somehow they don't seem to trust their piano sound. They don't think it's going to sound at all unless they play it. Well, unfortunately, contrast is the whole name of the game. So the press. The press is where you say to yourself, and people talk about this all the time, uh, affirmations, visualization. Plan to make a great sound. I intend to make a beautiful sound on the press. I intend to make a beautiful sound. I do make a beautiful sound. I intend to make a beautiful sound. I do make a beautiful sound. Okay? So you reinforce to yourself, I can do this. Yeah. Just one note at a time. Frankly, that's all we do. One piece at a time, one recital at a time. So I intend to make it, and the main thing here is not to move the arm or hand to do the pressing. This is strengthening the note. You strength, because playing the note is pulling the string. So you take away the musical part altogether. You just do the pressing part. But make sure that when you return, you go right to your very best spot on the finger. And press, and as you say, I intend to make a beautiful sound at set volume, at specific volume. Pianissimo, I press the string to the maximum, I release it, pianissimo. And then you go to the next one, again, pianissimo. And if you go home and try this, you will find that as you go up the instrument, your angle of your hand changes, things change, and cause you to suddenly you're not so pianissimo anymore. Maybe you're, you know. So this is where the control comes in. Then you do the play. I do make and it's in rhythm. In rhythm, you set, it can be very slow, but you set in advance. How fast am I going to do it? So you know you're going to get back on there for that press ahead of when you need to for this play. Not to be constantly hitting at the heart, like, oh my god, I'm going to do this. Right? You're there. You know where you're going to be. And you're there ahead of your needing to be. Now, the one thing you can do during the playing part is I do make a beautiful sound. The one thing that you can't do during the playing part, and this goes for a full performance. And that is, you can't evaluate, judge, think about it, estimate, criticize. No. The performance is in the moment. And when you're playing a whole piece, a whole recital, there is no time for reflection. You're on to the next thing. So, well, how does this, how does this bear on the idea of the performance? Well, when you're in front of an audience, Nobody wants to hear you make remarks about your own performance. You're performing. You don't, you don't shake your head when you made a mistake. <laughs> you all laugh. You don't, uh, you don't make faces. Oops. You don't make faces. You don't say oops. You don't blurt out an inappropriate word <laughs> over your own playing. The time for critiques is afterwards. 
the fudge work. Well, this is very important, I think, because the, tr the thing is, you may make a mistake, but when you tell the audience you made a mistake, yeah. you've made two mistakes. Two mistakes. <laughs> okay? So, the time for judging is after you're done. Nobody wants to hear or know what you thought of your last thing. You're on to the next thing. Has anybody ever seen doggy agility trials at the dog shows? You know those dogs where they go through the course? You know sometimes they'll knock a bar off, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen one of them go, oh gosh darn it, I knocked a bar off, <laughs> right? No. Why? They're on to the next thing. They know the clock is ticking. That's so three seconds ago. And the same is true when you're at the heart. You're playing. Unless you fall off the bench. Yeah, that hasn't <laughs> happened to me. That's never happened to me. I haven't, however, heard someone blurt out a whole sentence while they're supposedly entertaining Play. us. Oops. Yeah. So Oops. the time for judging <laughs> is afterwards. You, you say, I know where I'm going. I decided in advance when the concert's going to be. I'm committed. Prepare. The press is the press part is your price. This corresponds in the micro, this is a microcosm of your entire process of preparing for performance. The practicing, you get to press the string, you say, I, I wonder, I, I intend to make a beautiful sound. When you practice, you say, I intend to do a great job for those people. Mm -hmm. Practice, and you do. And then you relax, get the tension away. Some people raise, but all schools. Lucille Lawrence, I've read her own writings and her students' writings. The hand goes into the palm, goes into the palm, and bounces out. And then you can raise or whatever. I didn't learn raising, but we certainly learned relaxing. Slow, throw that, get rid of that tension so you're good for the next one. And this is why it's a microcosm, so that you're good for the next performance. Now, the time for revaluation is when you're doing the relax. Did I love that sound? Is that a beautiful sound? Would I pay money to hear somebody play that? That's what you want to use as your criterion. Not, it's okay. It's okay for me. It's good. It should be so good that you can ask people for money. And then you go on to the next one. So you judge and evaluate and as needed next to you. Was that piano enough? And when you decide in advance, these are all going to be pianissimo because I have music that I'm working on that calls for me to play pianissimo in this range. And one by one, you do those little notes. And the next one, is it piano? Was that piano enough? Now when I do this, I set myself a goal to do the whole scale at the volume that I determined in advance. And when I go along and I go further up and suddenly my position changed and blank and it's loud, that's wrong. Back to the beginning of the scale. Can, would you mind just demonstrating maybe an octave or part of an octave or something the way you do, the way you practice that? Let's start this way. louder, not so good. Yeah. Oh, too loud. See, I'd go back and start over, because that was okay. too loud. Two of them were too loud. I'm actually touching the one next to it, that's why you hear it. Are you pressing it into the next string? I'm pressing it into the next string. It's actually touching. You hear the next string. Yeah. The strength you need to push the string that far, you will need for loud for loud things. The point is, you're not using your whole hand or arm. This is what strength. See, a lot of people think the heart looks like this, like that. No. You don't use your arm to pull the strings. No more than ballet is going. Yeah. 
has to have soul. The sound has to have tone. Mm -hmm. You press, you say, I want to make a beautiful sound. I do make a beautiful sound. <laughs> One after another. Because you have music that calls for you to play piano in this register and delicately and everything. You do one, you practice one note at a time, and when you ask them to be there, they'll all be there. So that's what I do. And then you replace. And the big challenge in replacing, if you don't mind me saying, is to replace without, without buzzing. Without buzz. Okay? So I'm talking about a clean replace. Very clean where you just sneak in right behind that string. You don't just flap the finger all over the place like, oh, well, whatever, because buzzing is a big flaw in people's playing at a very advanced level. I've seen buzzing at all Regardless levels. Regardless of technique, whichever oh, way you approach it, no, you no. don't buzz. But the part, of, part of this exercise is replacing cleanly without a buzz. Like that. It's quiet or as loud as it's supposed to be. And you do that with every finger? All four fingers? All volumes, all registers. Don't you have music that calls for you to play in a certain volume? I mean, Salzado variations through you. They've got stuff that's up in the whole thing's all up in here. And I've got notes where I have to play, you know, various tempi and various uh, volume levels and stuff that all range and all registers. It goes over the whole instrument, one finger at a time. So that, get out there. And you say, what am I doing there? You say, I've done this a million times. Because guess what? If you take yourself through that process, I tend to make a beautiful sound, do over and over, you have done it times. And that's how where you get the assurance. Has anybody ever seen the movie about the guy who walked on the tightrope between the World Trade Center towers in 1974? It won Best Documentary a few years ago when it was made. A man set up a 7 8 cable with his team between the Twin Towers in 1974 before they were open. And he transited that cable seven times yeah. with, a, with nothing but a, a very large a bar in his hands. He had a 25-foot bar. And him and his little outfit, his little shoes, he went and did that. Nobody remembers this. They made a fabulous documentary, Man, Man on Wire. Yeah. Man on Wire. <clears throat> One of the striking things was they showed Lots of footage of his early preparations. He's in the first time he did this. He did this at the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris or something between some tour, you know, these tour towers. But they showed him practicing. And just a thing like this far off the ground. Over and over and over again. Nobody goes out to walk between, on a 7 eighths cable between the Twin Towers without saying to themselves, I've done this a million times. I'm not scared because I've done it. I know I've done it a million times. So, but she, this is the thing. I mean, this is a fascinating thing. I constantly think about this guy because we do something quite similar. We do something very hard. You go out there and you have to feel, I know what I'm doing. And that's another thing about the commitment when I talked about being, when you say that you're going to play a concert or be on a program at a certain date, he can't get out there and say, gee, I just feel like doing this anymore today, you know? Sorry, you're in the middle of it. He's in the middle, and he's got to follow through for, you know, and that's the thing. Well, same with us, because as this happens, I have actually seen it done, where a person allowed their name to appear on the program for, for the chapter, and there, and then when time came, they were physically present, they just went, oh, I just don't feel like mine. Well, <laughs> that's not commitment. I mean, that's not the behavior of a professional truth player, or even a, a, you know, even a good player. Yeah. So you keep doing those over and over again. You repeat in rhythm. Match the volume to the previous note. If it was too loud, go back to the beginning. Because people know who Pablo Casals, the famous cellist uh, of the 20th century, he used to say that he didn't take a piece out into repertoire until he had played it 100 times through to his own satisfaction. And if he went to number 70 and it was bad, he would go back to the beginning of the 100 petitions. And that's how you get the confidence to come out and say, I know I can do it because I have done it. And the same thing is true here. This is how you get ready to give your best to the audience.
comments, but that really was the sum of my, of my 